Welcome to The Connecting Point. Amen. Good morning. Some of you I saw were eyeing my cup nervously. How fast would he talk if he drank coffee? It's, they don't let me have coffee. It's just water. Don't get excited. I, you wouldn't want to see me on coffee. I'm pretty sure it would be pretty scary. But Today I want to take a few minutes and talk about prayer. Um, I told you guys last week that, that God had put a burden on my heart about this, and, and I really want to pray that um, God uses this as a time to really get us to connect with who and what God is. Uh, the tagline today is, is something I think really summarizes everything that I want to tell you, and that is this. What is prayer? Prayer is my opportunity, my opportunity, okay, to interface with the creator of the universe and the architect of my life. I'm curious if anyone else is excited that the creator of the universe and the architect of my life are the same person. Can I say it again? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, right? The creator of the universe and the architect of my life are the same person. Why do we pray? Why do we get involved in prayer? Why am I trying to tell you that I think prayer is important? Because it is my opportunity to enter interface with those two people who are the same person. And to ask the creator of the universe and the architect of my life to sort of get me on the game plan. Amen? Prayer is important. People often ask me, why are we not where we need to be? Why are we not where God would have us to be? Why am I not accomplishing in my life the things that, that God seems to be setting in front of me? And, and we wonder why we get going for God and then we seem to falter. And we get going for God and then we seem to falter. And we sort of have this roller coaster experience with God. I'm doing great with God and God's my buddy and then I got a flat tire and now I'm mad at God. And then, I'm, okay, that was silly. I'm going to get right with God. I'm good. God, life's good. And then, and then my four-year-old decided to paint my house with diaper ointment. I'm not, I'm mad at God again. And then we're just like, oh, okay, that's silly. I'm going to get good with God because I have a great job. I have a great job. I got fired. Now I'm mad at God. Do you follow what I'm saying? We just have this roller coaster experience. And people come to me all the time. Why are we not experiencing the power of God? I mean, you read about it in Scripture. We read about it in the Scriptures. Why do we see it there, but we don't see it in our life? Why is that? Why don't we notice what God wants us to notice? Why do we miss it? And I think it's really simple. If you ask me why marriages fail, it's often because it's communication. Sometimes too much and sometimes not enough. The only other thing that, that causes marriages to stumble is money, but generally it's the communication about the money that's really the cause of the problem, right? Saying clever things like, where'd all the money go? It's not good marriage. That's not a good marriage statement. You know, not a good, that's not a good opening line for, you, for your marriage retreat weekend, right? It's important that we recognize that communication is, is vital. If you have a job and you want to be advanced in that career and you want to move forward with that career, learning to communicate is key. One of the things that I struggle with, and I, I work a lot with people in the computer science field, that's, that's the, those are the students at my university, and I'm teaching them, and computer scientists are not, let's see, um, what's a good way to say it? Not the most outgoing, communicative bunch, right? I mean, it's okay. People say, well, you shouldn't engage in stereotypes. And I tell people there's a reason that there are stereotypes. Right? It doesn't mean they're true or right, and certainly not true in every case, and no, we shouldn't prejudge people because of it, but we can't ignore it. And I tell them, do you want a job or do you want to own the company? The difference between having a job and being a worker bee and being the manager of the worker bees or being the big boss over the managers is communication. The ability to, to get the thoughts out of your head and out of your heart and out there in the world. It makes a difference in every single profession. There's not one bit of job advice I could give you that's applicable to all fields that's more important than that. Learning to convey and communicate your ideas. Learning to speak well. Learning to get in front of people and, and be able to express your, your heart and your ideas. If that's true in corporate America, and it's true in our universities, then I gotta believe it's true in our churches. 
It's got to be true in our everyday relationship with God. Why do we struggle? We struggle because we have problems that we keep secret. We have struggles that we believe are not common to all people. We have pain that we feel if we can bury it deep enough and hide it long enough, it'll somehow magically evaporate. Can I ask you a question in a moment of honesty? Have any of you ever found pain to magically just disappear on its own? When we bury it, what happens? It grows roots. It gets wider. It grows higher and stronger. It always causes more pain. Well, I don't want to bother people with my problems. Do you know what God said? Bug me. Just go right ahead. Bother me. In fact, the passage after the passage we're going to look at today is the, the parable of the importunate friend. The guy who just keeps on knocking and keeps on knocking and keeps on knocking until you get out of bed and answer the door. Right? Why is God saying that when he talks about prayer and then he uses that parable? He's saying, just keep asking. You will never bother me. Amen? Oh, I, you know, God's busy. The universe and planets and all that stuff's going on. I, oh, I don't want to bug him with my, with my, little, my little, you know, drive to work. God cares about the minutia of your life. If you don't believe me, read the book of Leviticus. Don't, don't try and read it all at once, but pace yourself. And you're going to find out that the God of the universe, the God of the cosmos, the God of the big and the giant, is actually a God of detail. The curtain will look like this. It will be made this way. It will have this kind of fabric. It will have this many rings spread this far apart on this type of rod in this kind of place facing this direction at this appointed time at the right time of year. What? The theme of the book of Leviticus is I got your back. I am a God of detail. God reminds us that, that a sparrow doesn't fall from the sky, but God knows about it. He reminds us that he numbers the very, the very hairs on our head, and, and I, that's an ever-changing number, amen? He doesn't just, like, figure it out at birth, and that's what we go with that, right? I mean, it goes up, it goes up for a while, and then it, and then it, and then it, then it goes off for a while. <laughs> right? As a, as a buddy of mine used to say, I'd rather it, I'd rather it turn gray than turn loose. <laughs> All of it is a sign of wisdom, man. Just go with it. Go with it think that we fail because we don't stop to pray. And God is so clear in Scripture that prayer is the key to everything. I just want to build this together just for a quick second. The disciples had seen a lot. The disciples walked with Jesus every day, and they'd seen a lot. They'd seen healing. He healed the sick and the infirm. He healed the blind and the deaf. He healed the lame. They saw him walking on water. They saw him casting out demons. They saw him raising the dead. They saw him feeding the thousands. So much more. These guys witnessed everything that Jesus did. They saw all of these amazing miracles. And, and I remind you what we talked about last week. And I'm so glad that so many of you decided to embrace the crazy all week long. But, and and it, it turns out I didn't get too much bad press about that. Mother's Day sermon called Embrace the Crazy. It worked out okay, but... You just had to be there, is what everyone said. You just, you just had to listen. It's okay. But, but it's interesting to see what happens when we embrace the crazy. We look at the things that are crazy in God's world are just the normal things. Right? Like jump into the furnace to find Jesus. I'm sorry, what? Right? Jump into the lion's den and hang out with God. Right? Jonah found Jesus in the belly of the whale. Right? I mean, these are weird places to go find Jesus. I'm not suggesting a change of venue, okay? If the AT goes out in July, we might experience some of those things, but no, other than that, I think we're good. I'm just saying it, we sometimes think that the only place we, everything has to be perfect for God to show up. Life has to be perfect, and, and I've got to get everything aligned, and I've got to get my heart right, and my head right, and my life right, and if I'll do all of that stuff and get everything going correctly, and when my life is perfect, God appears. And I'm going to tell you where God was that whole time. He was waiting for you in the valley. He was in the, in, in the pit of your misery. He was in your struggles and your trials and your hard times. 
You missed God. You missed him. Because you thought that God wasn't the lily of the valley. Right? I mean, you knew he's the bright and morning star, but you forgot he was the beauty in the dark places, the lily of the valley. You missed God because he was right there. He was walking beside you in those hard times when you felt like you couldn't go further and you didn't know. You felt totally abandoned by the world. You felt like there was no hope for you whatsoever. God was right there with you. Amen? I wrote a poem a few years ago called Footprints. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't write that. <laughs> That'd be fun to say, though, right? <laughs> just start claiming all the anonymous things. Hi, my name's Anonymous. So I just thought I'd introduce myself. But you guys have read footprints, right? The one set of footprints was those times when Jesus carried you, right? And, and, and that's a beautiful, scripturally accurate picture. We feel like when we get our life together, then God's going to show up. But God was there the whole time. God is the only thing that can get our life to be perfect. It can never, ever, ever achieve perfection without God. We can never be in line with God. We can never be on task for God. We can never be serving God. We can never be doing all the things we're supposed to be doing without God. Amen? It's not going to happen. I had a guy tell me we, we were knocking on doors at an apartment complex and sharing the gospel with people. And this fellow said, man, he said, I thank you guys for coming by today, man. I, do, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. He said, as soon, listen, I'm going to come to church. I'm going to come to Jesus. As soon as I quit doing drugs, I am going to come to Jesus. He said, listen, as soon as I stop, as soon as I stop smoking crack and stop drinking beer, I'm, I'm going to come to Jesus. He said, listen, as soon as I stop cheating on my wife and smoking crack and drinking beer, then I'm going to come to Jesus. He said, listen, as soon as I stop beating my wife and cheating on my wife, and he went through this long list, and we stopped, and we said, whoa! You're not going to fix any of that without Jesus. You got the order backwards. But that's what he felt. He felt like his sin was keeping him from Christ. His sin was in the way of Christ, and I've got to fix my sin, and then I can come before God. Man, how lost can we be? You know what God wants? It's so simple. Just come to him. Come as you are. What an amazing God we serve. And no, no, I don't need you to clean up. Right? Those are good friends. You, this is how you can tell how good of friends you are. If you go to someone's house and it's totally clean, you're not that close. You are a guest at their house. If you go to their house and one room that you're going to be in is clean, then you're getting somewhere. Can I use your bathroom? No. There's, there's a gas station not very far down the road. If you, you know. If you go to someone's house and you're like, then you're friends. <laughs> Amen. If you're stepping over toys, just slide the laundry off the couch and sit down, you're tight. When are we going to get it? I mean, real friends, you don't clean up when real friends come to your house. They get it. If you come, I have five children that are like me, hyper, crazy, ridiculous kids like me. If you come to my house, you better wear shoes. There are Legos on the floor. <laughs> you will experience the greatest pain known to mankind. Women, I get it. I know childbirth is bad, but it's not like stepping on Legos in the middle of the night. My wife, my wife agrees. She's had five kids, all natural, I'll tell you. She says, no, I'll take that over Legos through the foot at 2 a.m. any day. <laughs> a close second is catching your pinky toe on the couch as you're walking by. You know that one? Or the door jam, yeah, that, those are close feelings. You know if you come to my house, that's what you're going to get, right? Our couches are, were nice at one point. There's a good chance that there's some Kool-Aid somewhere on that couch, okay? There's probably a Cheerio in there. If you get hungry at my house, pull up a cushion. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you will not go hungry in my car. I just... The farther you go back in my car, the more food you will find. Now, somebody just said, we don't allow the children to eat in our car. Okay, have a few more. <laughs> we made the same, we're never going to, we have this new car, we're never going to allow our kids to eat there. It lasted for a really long time. It's not. It's just not going to happen, I'm sorry. Listen, 
what am I trying to say? I don't want you to come to my house only when it's perfect. Because that is so rare. I want you to come to my house when it's real. Because I want to I want to interface. I don't if you want to give me like a health score and put it on my door when you leave, fine. That's okay. But listen, do you know what I really want from you? I really just want to fellowship with you. I just want to meet you where you are. And and listen, in a a more serious note, but exactly the same thing, you don't have to be perfect to be my friend. You don't have to have it all together to be my friend. Okay, like I say about your physical house, your spiritual and emotional house doesn't have to be perfect before we can start interfacing. Amen? In fact, if if the way I know that you actually love me is when you allow me into your spiritual and emotional house when it's dirty. When you feel comfortable enough to come to me and say, I'm broken... I'm hurting, I'm in pain, I'm lost, I'm in anguish, I don't know how to go, I don't know where to go, I don't know how to do this, I need your help, I need guidance. That's when I know you love me. Amen? And you know I love you when I say, bring it on. I'm not afraid of your pain. I'm not afraid of your sorrow. I'm not afraid of your spiritual, emotional messiness. It doesn't bother me at all because I know Jesus. I know the cure. Amen? Fake, perfect, is the most unhealthy thing we do. Pretending, you know, you've heard me say the pretty plastic people, you know, we come to church. Hey, how's it going? Glad to see you. So glad you're here. Yes, everything's wonderful. Yes, uh, we were almost late for church because all of our kids were doing their own independent Bible study before we got here. (laughs) Yes, my son just finished up memorizing the Revelation. Yes, I know. We were a little late, but hey, it's okay. Right? I've been a pastor of a church for a long, long time. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to share with you a moment of sincere honesty, okay? I don't care how many kids you have, that's more than you can handle. Even if you have zero, it's more than you can handle, okay? The very idea of the thought of them is enough, right? But we live in the church parking lot. Our commute to church is a 100-foot walk across the parking lot, okay? And we still find a way to be late, it's a lot of hair and dresses and shoes, and you get one fix, and then the other one goes playing, and then they get, it's just a lot. And there have been a few times when we've gone across the parking lot, crushing my Yosemite salmon, you know Yosemite Sam? Saddest fucking fucking sucking across, right? You've all been there, right? Get your kids coming in, rah, rah, rah. and we come to the door, and it's just, rah, rah, hey, hey, God bless you. Man, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Isn't God good? Woo, right? Is God honored by my fake? Is God glorified by my pretend? Never, right? I'm sharing with you guys a moment of honesty. And we're laughing together because we've all been there. But what I want you to hear is that I am where you are. I have not not fixed this thing. I don't... I've not perfected life. I cannot do anything I need to do without Christ. I've been a Christian for like nine or, I don't know, 950 years or something. And I still can't make it one day without Christ. I am not growing more independent of his input in my life. I'm growing more dependent on his constant input in my life. And I don't want you to get in the perception that if you were a really good Christian, your life would work great. The truth is, if you were the best Christian on the planet Earth, you know what happened? God would be talking to Satan about you. Yeah, that's right. Right? Have you considered my servant Job? Job's like, thanks. Thanks for that. The old bullseye right there, yeah. Right? I mean, at the end of it, and this is what he says, you can have your way with him, just don't touch him. And eventually he says, all right, you can touch him, just don't take his life. Job says, yet though he slays me, I will trust him. Wow. If you are not humbled by Job's faithfulness, then you haven't read it. Is Job perfect? No. Eventually, having no one to turn to, he eventually does fall for his own self-pity. And he eventually questions God. God, what what are you doing? (laughs) To which God gives one of the greatest replies ever recorded in Scripture. Hey, Job, 
Where were you when I created the universe? Where were you when I brought everything into existence? Where were you? I am the Almighty. Don't you question me. Amen? I'm not promising you that when you become a really good Christian, you don't need God anymore. It's exactly the opposite. Becoming an awesome Christian means that you realize how frail and weak you are without him. People have criticized Christianity and said, Christianity is for the weak-minded. Well, I don't really know what weak-minded means. In their context, I think it just means stupid. Maybe it means gullible. But if you mean that I have the self-actualization, the self-realization to say that I cannot make it one day without God, I'm guilty. I will gladly take whatever title you want to bestow upon me because I am 100% completely dependent on God's presence in my life every day. Why do we fail? We fail because we think we can fake God out. We think we can pretend to be good enough that God's like, oh yeah, they're okay. And it's like when my kids clean their room, let me hang that in air quotes. My wife, this is what my wife says, go clean your room, they go away, and she, you know, little Hannah comes back, says, I clean my room, Mom. And my wife says, even under your bed? To which Hannah replies, because the way we clean our room is by shoving everything under the bed. Right? Good Parenting 101, never have bed coverings that cover the floor. Leave a, leave a six-inch gap so you can always see, right? You know what I'm saying? You never know what you might find under there. Peanut butter sandwiches. They're not even allowed to eat in the room. I have no idea how I got there, but there is one somehow there. I don't know how that, how that happened. Right? We, we get it backwards. We want the world, if, if enough people vote us perfect, then we think God's going to say, oh, okay, that must be, must be okay. If enough people think we're a good person, then, you know, hey, maybe we are good people. And the problem is the standard isn't the people and the standard isn't the world. The standard is Jesus Christ. And because he is our standard, then I'm never going to be perfect enough without him. In fact, the only thing that draws me towards his perfection is his presence inside of me. Amen? My wedding band is, is gold. This is my wife's that I wear, as you guys know. But this is, the, this is my wife's wedding band that constantly reminds me that she is with me everywhere I go and everything I do. And it's gold. And it's, it's not super amazing, but it's gold. Do you know what makes it valuable? Well, certainly the intrinsic value is higher to me than the physical value. But what makes this precious is the more gold that's in it. That the more gold that's there, the, the higher the value of that gold, right? The thing it's the more Christ that is in me, the higher my value. It's not more of Mike in me. That's devaluing it. That's the, that's the kind of the scum you have to scrape off the top of the pot, you know? That's what the impurities are trying to get out. And you know how you get those impurities out of gold? The furnace. Yeah, we don't like the furnace a lot, do we? The crucible. That's where we need to spend our lives. In the crucible. God, heat me up. And all the scummy stuff that floats to the top, scrape it off, and I'll be more pure. And then I'll get out in the world, and I'll get hardened again, and I'll come back to the crucible, and I'll ask you, God, to just melt me down, and all the scum that floats to the top, just skim it off. And through that process, that gold is refined, it becomes more and more pure. Why, if we want to be gold, do we fear the furnace? That's how we get more valuable. Amen? Why, if we are a construction project, are we afraid of construction? Amen? I love caution tape and orange cones in my life. Right? Hey, something's going on here. Amen? They're fixing it. It's going to be better. Right? It's going to be better. The disciples had seen so much. They'd seen all the things that God had done. They were so curious about all those things, all those great miracles that were not miracles to God, but they were to man. But they didn't ask how to do these miracles. When the disciples had a chance to ask Jesus something, ask a favor of him, they didn't ask how to do these miracles. 
They didn't ask what did they observed. They didn't talk about how was the power gathered. They didn't ask how the miracles were performed. They, they didn't say, why couldn't we do the same? When they observed the miracles, it turns out they only had one question. It's Luke chapter 11. They only had one thing they asked for. Luke chapter 11 and verse 1 says, And it came to pass that as he was praying, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. This is an interesting observation. When the disciples approached Christ and said, we want something, they didn't say, we want the power. Right? They didn't say, Lord, touch my hand and let me have the hand of an evangelist. <laughs> Woo, glory. I so, the first time I go preach at a church sometime, I want to preach like that. That would be so much fun. They'd never have me back, but it would be so much fun, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be awesome? The Lord has delivered us. That would be awesome, but I'm not going to do it today. They didn't ask for the hand of the evangelist, right? They didn't ask for fire shooting from their fingertips. They didn't ask the secret to doing all this stuff. They asked for one thing because here's what they had observed. Do you remember why Jesus missed the boat? Jesus and his disciples are on one side. Jesus goes off. The disciples get in the boat and start across. And then Jesus comes walking across the water to meet them. Do you remember why Jesus missed the boat? Probably important, by the way. Yeah. Do you think because he was running late? Do you think because he wanted to show off? He was praying. That's right. He was praying. The feeding of the 4,000. I know you're thinking the 5,000. No, there's, there's two times in Scripture this happened. No less miraculous. Jesus prayed, and his food was multiplied. The feeding of the 5,000, which is really more like 18 or 20,000 people, Jesus prayed, and then the food was multiplied. Every time before these mighty miracles, guess what Jesus was doing? If there's anybody on the planet that didn't need to pray, it was Jesus who spent his time praying to... himself? We're not going to have a Trinitarian discussion here, are we? You guys know this, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three and one, one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. We're good? Got it? Same God. Same God, right? We got this? I mean, yes, I know he's praying to the Father, and I appreciate that, but praying to the Father is like praying to my left ear instead of my right ear. What on earth did he pray about? Do you think he was praying, I, I need to know which way to go? Do you think he was praying for discernment? He's God. He did not ever pray because he needed to pray. He prayed because I need to pray. And he knew that prayer is focus time. I've shared with you guys before, one of the coolest moments, there are a lot of amazing things about playing sports. I, I love to play sports, but one of my favorite moments ever is, and if you guys, I know a lot of you are um, Georgia fans, and if you go to the game, you, you see the, the football team sort of in the, in the alleyway there, like ready to come on the field, and they're jumping, and they're headbutting, which always seems silly to me, by the way, because it hurts. I, I'm just going to throw it out there. I don't care how tough you think you are. When you bang heads, it hurts, and you can act like it doesn't, but we all know you're not smart enough to realize it really hurts. And they're slapping each other, and they're hugging each other, and they're bouncing. They're bouncing like, yeah, let's go. I love that moment. That moment of, like, anticipation of, like, yes, let's get fired up, and they run out in the field, right? And everyone, ah, it's amazing. Love those moments, right? And I used to do that as an athlete. I would always have some routine to psych myself up, something that was just like, all right, it's time. 
right? Uh, some of you know I've done a lot of different sports. I've done some really ridiculous sports on top of all that. But one of them was springboard diving. I don't know why I did springboard diving. It's a whole long story, and we'll get into it some other time. But I've got to be honest with you. When you're going to throw yourself 45 feet in the air over a pool of water that you really can't see very well, and you're going to spin and flip so fast that there's no human way you could possibly understand where you are, prayer is a good thing. Because you might not think, you might say something foolish like, oh, it's just water, and that means you've never done it. Because if you hit the water the wrong way, I assure you, you will not go, oh, it was just water. You will ask, did I land on the pool deck? But I would. I'd stop at the end of the board, deep breath. My mind right in the center where I needed to be. And my first step forward was always this one, right? Get going. Every play before football, I played linebacker. Linebacker has to watch the play, follow the ball, hit the guy, hit all the people in the way of the guy with the ball, right? Every play, focus, get ready. I played baseball, I love playing baseball. Every time before you step in the batter's box, you focus your mind. What Jesus wanted us to understand was that even as God, he's going to stop and focus. I'm just going to throw it out there. If he needed to stop and focus, pretty sure I need to. Amen? He knew that what was about to happen was that important. Of all the things the disciples could have gotten on fire about, of all the things they could have seen and understood, of all the things out there, the one thing they asked was, Lord, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples, teach us how to pray. Because what they saw was that God went away to pray, and then he came and did things that defied their ability to understand them. And they made a connection of prayer with power. But I want to make sure you understand something. We don't ever have to pray for power. Is that okay if I say that? Did I mess with your head now? Are we not friends anymore? Are some of you unfriending me on Facebook even as we speak? Put your phone away. Hold on. Let me finish. Let me finish. I don't need power. I need God. And when God is in me, and God, it's not power, it's presence. The presence of God is more power than I can understand. The presence of God is more than I can ever even comprehend. I don't need God's power. That's like saying I want something that I want God to stay far away and sneak his power to me. I want the presence of God. And the presence of God exudes power. Does that make sense? Amen? It's like the lights going out of the power plant. What? It exudes power. presence of God. What do I pray for? The presence of God. And that is all the power I could ever handle. This is what God was praying. Now, some of you will get distracted in what we often call the Lord's Prayer. Let me just take a, a moment to step aside and explain my personal belief about this. If you said, Mike, tell me about the Lord's Prayer, then I'm going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord's Prayer is not my will, but yours be done. That is the Lord praying. If you want to know the Lord's heart on prayer, the Lord's prayer to me is not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Amen? The model prayer is what we have here. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? That prayer is the model prayer. So if it helps you to think that through, I just want to make sure... We don't really want to say that that is what God prayed. Because the question wasn't, Lord, pray in front of us and let us listen. The, the, the request was, teach us how to pray. You see the difference there? But if you want to know God's heart on prayer, you have it from the book of Genesis to the Revelation. God has written his word over and over and over. You don't have to wonder what God's will is for your life. It is written right there in the scriptures. You want to know God's heart about prayer? then you listen to the prayer at Gethsemane. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Amen? Let's read the prayer, the model prayer. He said to them, when you pray, say this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who, has, who is indebted to us. The same idea, right? And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is not one thing in the whole wide world wrong with that prayer. And if you recite what people call the Lord's Prayer in moments when you need God's presence, go for it. But let me make sure you understand something. It is not a mantra. You guys know the word mantra or chant? A mantra is a saying that you repeat over and over in hopes that it has a transcendent ability to do something you don't understand. You follow that? A mantra is something that I, I, I have no idea what I'm saying. I have no idea what this thing really means, but I keep saying it in hopes that it has a transcendent power, a power beyond my ability that's going to magically summon some higher source. This is not God's model for prayer. God's model for prayer is that it starts in our heart and that we speak directly to God. It's not a mantra. If we repeat it and recite it and expect that to have power, it never will. If we recite it, but we mean it, it will be as powerful as any prayer ever made. But if you don't mean it, it doesn't mean anything. That was pretty profound, right? I know, it's deep thoughts with Mike Franklin. If you don't mean it, it doesn't mean a thing. Hey, baby, I love you. Well, awesome. What does that word mean? What does that phrase mean? Hey, I love you. Okay. I told you, we say I love you about a lot of things. I love my car. I love pizza. Right? I love to play golf. Oh, and I love my wife. <laughs> Isn't she enthused? Glad to be on the playing field with pizza. Right? Well, that's not what I meant. That's a perfect guyism. You know what I meant. Can I explain a little bit of a woman's mind to you? Um, it doesn't matter what you meant. It only matters what she heard. And what you need to learn is make sure that what she heard is what you meant. <laughs> Do not give them homework. Don't say something and leave them alone to do the homework to figure out what you meant. Just be plain. Keep it easy. By the way, that logic works in reverse for fellas. Don't make us guess. No, we don't have any idea what you mean. If you say, honey, did you forget something? Yes, we did. <laughs> and you asking us is not going to remind us. Just tell us what we forgot. And we'll get right to the I'm sorry and we can move on. Did you forget something? Probably. Do you know what it is? No clue. <laughs> but if you tell me, I will both do it and tell you I'm sorry. Wouldn't that be a lot more fun than us wasting 30 minutes? <sighs> <sighs> I can't believe you can't remember. I can't believe you think I'd remember anything. If I were to say something like, did you fellas remember to put pants on today? Half of them would look. <laughs> and you want us to remember something important? It's like asking, what did you have for breakfast? I don't know. It was good, but I don't remember. And you want us to remember really important stuff? Like things like this, like, did you remember to bring the kids home? Were they with me? I can't count to five. I don't know. We are simple-minded creatures. We have good hearts. Give us a break. I say this to say, we don't get away with saying, God knows what I mean. When you pray, it needs to be honest and simple, sincere. It can't be Oh, Lord, you know what I mean. Because prayer isn't about changing God. Prayer doesn't change God. Amen? Prayer changes me. I am not going to reveal anything to God that he's going to be like, oh. everything I say to God, he's like, yeah, I know. Lord, I really blew it. Yeah, I know. 
got it written down right here. I've been waiting on you to deal with this. Lord, I, I really messed up. I, I know. God's never surprised by my sin. He has it recorded. Do you know what he's surprised by? Do you want to know what shocks him? Do you want to know a little bit? If he was, if he was more like human beings, do you know what would really frustrate him? How long it takes us to admit it. I knew you sinned when you sinned. Why are we talking about this six months later? Why would you carry this burden and this pain for so long? Amen? When my dad was younger, we won't get into the details, but let's just say that at school, pencil lead ended up in his arm. Okay, you can make up your own story about it, and you're probably going to be right. Let's just cut to the chase. The pencil lead ended up in his arm. Well, the problem with pencil lead in your arm is that not only does it hurt, but it gets infected really fast. But if that graphite, if that piece gets into your blood, it'll start to poison your blood. It's a very, very, very bad thing. You can trace the little red line. And if that little red line ever gets to your heart, you've got a problem. And what he did was he didn't want to talk about the story about how the pencil lead got in his arm, which would have meant a spanking for him. So he tried to ignore the pencil lead in his arm until it got to the point where he was almost going to die from it. And when you go to the doctor in a moment like that, they don't ever go, man, you came at just the right time. They look at you like, hey, knucklehead, why did you wait so long? I broke this little bone in my finger one time. It wasn't very exciting. I've done a lot of ridiculous things in my life, but this particular time there was just a bee in my car, and I went to punch the bee. Oh, it gets better. It was 110 degrees, so when I punched the bee, my Jeep windshield shattered. I didn't hit it hard. I just went, but I, apparently I hit it just right. So I did get the bee, which is awesome because it stung me. It's hard to look cool when you go, and then my windshield shattered. It's just dumb things. But I waited a month of complaining and whining about it, hurting and hurting and hurting before I finally went to the doctor. And the doctor said, well, <laughs> you, might, you might not know this, but you're too late. For me to fix it now, guess what I'm going to have to do? Yeah, breaking it the first time was fun. How about re-breaking it? That was awesome. But this godly doctor looked at me, he said, you know, I've always heard that the Lord watches over fools and Baptist preachers. <laughs> Even though I'm sure that's the same category of folks. He says, and it's healed exactly right. So you're, you know, God's looking out for you, but if it hadn't, you'd have just had this pain forever, right? Just, why do we do this? God, God wonders why we don't just come to him honestly and just say it. Why can't we just come to him? How do we pray? Well, let me read a couple of passages. Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? How do we pray? Honestly, openly, we don't, we don't hold back. And we pray with thanksgiving. Let me read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I get asked by some of you to pray over hard things. Some of you have come to me and said, I'm in this terrible situation, this is going on. Will you pray with me? And you've probably noticed that in that prayer, I think, thank God. And I'm willing to bet that some of you are like, dude, for real? Because what we're praying about is super serious and you're really upset and you're really worried and here I am thanking God for it. You're like, hey, same team, buddy. Right? But I am forced, constrained, compelled to believe the Bible is true. And when God says to pray with thanksgiving, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray with thanksgiving. Now, sometimes I'm thankful for all the other stuff that isn't wrecked in my life. Amen? Sometimes I'm thankful for the ability to pray to a God who's actually listening to me pray about the thing I'm about to pray about. 
Sometimes I'm thankful for a lesson that I'm going to learn through this horrible thing that I pray comes quickly so I can move past it. But I'm always thankful. Not fake, but genuinely. Many times I've started off with a prayer request in my own life where I needed, to, I needed God's hand in my life, and I began to pray, and I started by thanking him for all he's done in my life, and honestly, by the time I finished thanking him for all the great stuff in my life, I could not remember for the life of me why I started praying. God was like, check mark. Amen? Done. That was easy. Sometimes we need that perspective. Even when we're going to God about hard things in our life, when we enter into it with thanksgiving, it's amazing what God will do in our life. God, I don't like this at all, but I still thank you for it. Amen? I was thinking about an example of this. It's the way we drive and a police officer's behind us. What? Wait, wait, why are you laughing? You... You should drive exactly the same way. You're thinking, oh, great, there's police behind me. You know what he's thinking? Could you just get out of the way? <laughs> Could you just really just get out? I want to pull you over to get you out of my way, <laughs> right? Just move. Why, why should it be different, right? But it is the truth of it. We should be thankful, right? We should be thankful. I'm glad if something happens, he's right behind me. I'm right there, ready to go. Cool. In fact, if he pulls up beside me, I can point out some people he needs to go talk to. (laughs) I'm helpful like that. They they actually don't need our help either, by the way, just so you know. When we pray, let me tell you a couple things that we need to do. First, we need to be honest. I don't know why we try to lie to God, but we do. God's never going to be impressed with our act. He's never going to fall for our lies. And all we're going to do is have ineffective prayers. If you say, God, I know you're up to something and I trust you, but you don't actually trust him, God's not going to believe you. And I want you to learn to pray to God in a way that you would speak to me or to anyone else on this planet. And this is the idea of the model prayer. The model prayer says open your heart and speak to God as if he is there. Do you want to know why? Because he is. But we do that, oh, Father, we are gathered here in your name. And I know God would never do this, but if I was God, I'd totally be like, <laughs> that prayer is going nowhere, man. Nowhere. I think when we pray, we should use big words. Why? You don't use big words when you're talking to other people? You think God is up there like, oh, great, you know, thesaurus, what's this guy talking about? Do you know what God really, really wants? He wants you to be honest. Listen, listen carefully. Not just with him. You know who he really wants to be honest with? With you. Do you know what God's favorite prayer is? Lord, I need you. And I'm going to tell you something, just, just you and I talking. There are times in my life when I have been so broken and so oppressed and so crushed that that is all I could pray. I might pray it for 30 minutes, but that is all I can say. Lord, I need you. God, I need you. Lord, I need you. Only you. I need you. If you're mad at God, okay, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but you can sort of wink at me, okay? How many of you have ever been mad at God? Liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, thank you. Some honesty, finally, right? All of us have been mad at God before. And I don't mean mad like you question his godness, but mad like you disagree with what he's doing in your life. He did something in your life you didn't like, and it makes you mad. So does it make sense that I'm going to go to God and pretend like I'm not mad when really inside I'm mad at God? I'm not telling you that you should make a habit out of being mad at God, because every time you're mad at God, listen, you're wrong. But to lie about it to God is never going to help you be less mad. God, I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I don't like this at all. But I trust you. Amen? I don't mean to call it out, but God will honor that prayer. 
uh, how we waste time with God. We spend 30 minutes in prayer when we could have said what we needed to say in two seconds if we'd have just been honest. Number one prayer rule, be honest. God already knows everything you're going to tell him. You don't need to fake it and pretend. You don't need to pretend to be really spiritual. Lord, I know this is a trial you're putting me through, and I'm going to learn a wonderful lesson. If you don't feel it, don't say it. You may know those things, but right now, Lord, I'm frustrated. But I trust you. Amen? Trust you. Be honest. The second thing is to be grateful. Hey, God, thanks for being here. Hey, God, thanks. Thanks for listening to me. God, thanks for all the amazing stuff you do in my life. I'm frustrated right now. I'm really, I'm really angry. And I'm actually angry at myself for being angry at you because I know how silly it is. But I'm not going to pretend like I'm not. I'm just going to say, man, I don't get it, Lord. I don't get what you're doing. I see godly people doing godly stuff and bad things happen, and I wonder what's up, God. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. But you know what, Lord? I'm going to trust you. Those are real prayers from my heart. I am voicing out loud real prayers from Mike's heart. That's how I pray. And And those of you who've prayed with me, you know that when I pray, I'm honest. And I'm just going to lay it out there, but I'm always going to be grateful because God's an amazing God. I, I, I met up here with a, a, a lady for two weeks, and we prayed together over something that crushes my soul. And God didn't answer the prayer the way we wanted it answered. So the next week when we were praying about it going the wrong way, we didn't, we're like, we didn't, I didn't try to be honest. I mean, I didn't try to fake it out and say, like, Lord, I know in your grand scheme things work. I was like, man, this isn't, the, this isn't what we wanted. But I'm going to trust you, God, that you're going to get glory out of it. And I pray for this person. I pray for this decision that, God, you'll, get, you'll, you'll figure it out. You'll teach and learn and help us to be patient and understand that it doesn't always go our way. Amen? Be honest. Be grateful. Be thorough. I'm always leery about this because some of you are closet prayers. Some of you can pray for an hour. I'm just going to tell you this is just me loving on you. That is so awesome, and you are my hero. I am not an hour-long prayer. Have I ever prayed for an hour? Yes. I have prayed for two hours solid without taking a breath. I have. But that is extremely rare. For me, I am succinct. I'm just going to cut right to it. I have learned to be honest, and when I've learned to be honest, it cuts down on my prayer time. I just get right to it. But I am a constant prayer. Now, I might not pray for one hour without taking a break, because my brain doesn't work like that, right? You guys see me, you're like, I know, that's my brain all the time. This is me being calm. I am faking you out. This is looking calm. Right? My brain is going, blah, 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 blah. I promise you. I would have eight zillion different thoughts in the middle of an hour-long prayer. If you are a one-hour prayer, God bless you. I need you. Pray for me, please. But what I do is I pray for an hour in five-minute intervals, constantly throughout the day. Today was a lovely drive over. It was lovely Especially when there are people who don't understand that turning your headlights on in the rain is not just the law. It's a good idea. We cannot see you. Turn on your lights, man. It's not that hard. Really? Deep breath. Cleansing, let it go. I prayed a lot on the way over here. I prayed for myself. I prayed for the service. I prayed for a lot of you guys individually. I prayed for Brother David always. Right, I prayed for my Sunday school teacher. I prayed. I prayed. All right, I prayed all the time. And then I, I prayed for my fellow imbeciles driving beside me and around me. I prayed for them a lot. You know, a lot. They're short prayers. So when I say be thorough, cover the topic. But don't drown it so that you lose focus. God, I'm here to do business. Amen? I'm here to do business. I, I need you. And I want to come before you. I'm not saying be short. Don't confuse those two things. Be thorough. I'm I'm actually arguing that you should pray as long as it takes for you to be honest with God and be grateful for all he's done for you. Be humble. I am a servant. We've we've gotten used to saying the word servant. The word is actually slave. And we're so, like the word slave grinds on us so much that we don't like to say the word anymore. But sometimes we lose it because servant kind of sometimes sounds like he's our boss and we work for him. And that's not really the case. He is my owner. He is my master. And I am his slave. He owns me. I was bought with a price. 
so I want to make sure that I approach the throne of grace. Now, I know the Bible says boldly, and I do boldly because I know I have access through Christ to the throne of grace, but I don't ever want to come saying, God, you know what you need to do in my life, so get on it. I know some of you are like, I would never do that. Liar! We've done it. Lord, that person needs a little divine intervention. You need to teach them a little what's what. We've done it. We've done it. Don't pretend like you haven't. Well, I've never done that. (laughs) Okay, you need to pray now. (laughs) We'll stop. We'll wait while y'all pray. Be humble. God, I need you. I can't make it without you. I can't see without you. And finally, I know you wish I could. Can we delete this last bullet? I don't really look. We can't, it turns out. Be patient. How many prayers does God answer on a percentage basis? 100%. It's a bold claim. God answers every prayer? Yes. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. We don't like that one very much. And sometimes he says, let's wait. I have lived long enough, and I know I haven't lived as long as some of you, but I've lived long, long enough to learn this lesson. God's up to stuff. And his plan is better than my plan, and he can see farther down the road than I can. And after enough years of time, I can look back and go, oh, I totally get it now. Because back then I was clueless and angry. I was fidgety. Come on, get it. Get, come on, God, do this. And God's like, dude, it's not me, it's you. I shared with you the other week about meeting my wife. I thank God every day. I, you know, I love her so much that I wish I had met her when I was two. You know what I'm saying? But I thank God I, I didn't meet her one week earlier than I did. Because God wasn't done cooking me yet. I wasn't ready. She'd have been like, mm. <laughs> right? God, I mean, I'm not saying I was pretty far along. I'm just saying I was a lot better off than I was before. So that when I met her, I was ready. She was ready for me. I thank God for that timing. Do you follow what I'm saying? But I think, oh, I wish it had happened earlier. I wish it had happened sooner. You know what? I'm glad it happened exactly when it happened. Our anniversary is coming up. In fact, it's, it's Tuesday. So any of you want to text me and help me remember that, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I won't, I won't forget. I'm just kidding. We've been married. We have been married for 19 years on, on Tuesday. Uh, we dated for three years before we got married. Uh, we dated for a year, and I gave her a promise ring. It's kind of an old, old way to do that. But to say, you know what, after a year of dating you, I want to talk about marriage. I don't want to ask you to marry me yet. I want to talk about it and pray about it. But I want to have an open conversation. So I gave her a promise ring to say that's what I want to do. We spent a year praying about marriage and making sure it was God's will for our life. And then we felt like our decision point was when we felt like that we could do, and this, I'm talking about prayer, right, just honest prayer, because I wanted to marry her the day I met her. Like, Lord, what time's the courthouse closed? We're at Chick-fil-A, and I'm, I'm good. I'm sold. She's eating Chick-fil-A with me and holding my hand when we pray. Done. But I I said, you know, my honest prayer was, God, I don't want to get married to her until we can do more together than we can apart. If we're serving you better not married, then we'll wait. And we waited until both of us agreed in our hearts that we could do more together for God than we could apart. Make sense? So we waited. We waited three years. That's, a, that's like an eternity for people nowadays. But it was an investment in our life. We knew we were going to get married the first date. It wasn't like we doubted or worried. We knew. We tried to pretend like we didn't for a while, maybe, but we knew. So that whole time we knew we were getting married. It was never like that. Being patient, not my skill set, by the way. <laughs> like, duh. <laughs> Being patient made it so that every moment of our marriage has been amazing. Even the hardest times that we've gone through have been incredible. Because there is one thing we never doubt, and that is that God brought us together. Because we gave God time to cement our hearts together. There's a process in the Bible, it's called weaving of the heart. And this is what God did for my wife and I. He took us stitch at a time, stitch at a time, and bound our hearts into one. And we never have to doubt that. If we'd have rushed into it, we may have doubts and worries. Many of you can attest to that. Many of you got married really fast, and then you had doubts and worries, and maybe you're still married to that person, but you had that season of, ah, and did we maybe, and we should have, I don't know, should have thought about this. Be patient. 
God's working on it. And God's timing is just as important as God's will. Amen? I say it all the time, and I don't mean to repeat myself, but the parting of the Red Sea would not have been nearly as cool one day earlier. Amen? It wouldn't have been nearly as cool one day later. Same miracle, parting of the Red Sea, amazing, but it wouldn't have been nearly as cool a day earlier when no one was there to watch it, or a day later when it would have been the fountain at the graveyard. Amen? It's not the miracle that we need, it's the God that we need. It's the timing. I need God now in my life, and I want to be patient to be where he wants me to be, doing what he wants me to do. If your life isn't changing, it's not God's fault. Say amen. You can agree with it later. Amen it because you know it's true now, and let it settle in on you later. If you're not where you feel like you need to be, it's not God's lack of power. Amen? It's not his ability or his interest that's in question. It's our willingness... Our humility, our patience, and I'll be honest with you, our gratefulness or lack thereof. What would happen if we were honest with God? If we prayed as if God were really there and if he really cared. God, I'm in a lousy mood today. I have a great job. I have a great family. I have a great spouse. I have plenty of money in the bank account. I mean, I don't have too much, but my life is basically really great, and I'm just in a lousy mood today, and I'm sorry. I'm not going to pretend like I'm not. I'm in a lousy mood today, God. Can you, can you help with that? You might say, come on, Mike. You're going to bother God with stuff like that? Yes. Because every hour that I'm miserable without turning to God, can I tell you what Satan's doing? He gets excited. When I wallow in misery, Satan owns me. Right? It's a shame, but it's true. Yeah, I, I bug God all the time. Silly stuff. Little things like, you know, Lord, I'm not asking you for divine intervention for this test that I'm about to take. Although I'm not opposed to it. But I pray, Lord, I've worked hard and I've studied. God, could you just help me to recall? I think that's a good prayer. Amen? I'm not saying, God, I blew it off and I didn't do anything for two weeks and now I want you to, oh, right? God, could you help me remember what it is I'm supposed to do today? God, could you open my eyes? We were talking about benevolence a little earlier. I walk through the cities of Atlanta. It's downtown all the time. And there are people always with cups out jingling for change. And, and I'll be honest with you, as a Christian, I have a huge struggle with that. I have a huge struggle. Because I know, I know, some of you are like, oh, they're just ripping us off. You know what, though? What's a dollar to you? I mean, if a dollar is keeping you out of the poorhouse, then what were you doing downtown at the Braves game anyway? I asked this question, Lord, that's what I asked. I said, God, I can't discern who's telling the truth and who really needs it and who doesn't. But you do know. And so, God, I pray for an instant compassion in my heart. And I will tell you that there are people that I walk past as coldly as if I didn't see them. And there are people that I stop and engage and people think, why on earth are you talking to that person? Because I say, God, I need you to decide for me. Is that a silly prayer? Maybe it sounds silly to you, but for me, it's just about being honest. God, I don't know. I can't tell. There's too many cups jingling for change. Amen? How do we decide who to help? Hey, you know what? How about you help me, God? Have I ever gotten swindled? Probably. Probably. But you know what God does with swindlers? If you give that money in God's name to do God's purpose, oh, man, it haunts them for. I'd spend $20 any day to have someone come to know Christ as their Savior. Amen? You can't swindle me because it was a gift. Oh, they probably used it to buy alcohol. <laughs> I bet it burned the whole way down, too. I bet they've never been so sick. As, as, as Mama would pray, I pray that they get sick as a goat. <laughs> I don't have any goats, but apparently they get really sick all the time. I don't know. <laughs> but that's what she'd say. If they do it, Lord, if they do it, I hope they get sick as a goat. That's all right, isn't it? That's honest prayer, isn't it? Because you know what she meant by that was, hey, even if they try to trick me and they go buy alcohol with this or whatever, use that to reach into their life. Honest prayer, simple prayer, 
Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that you are always welcome at the summit. We are located on Highway 81 south of Loganville. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. and worship is at 10.30 a.m. For more information, you can visit our website at thesummitchurch.com.